सर वी आर लाइव नाउ प्लीज स्टार्ट परफेक्ट थैंक यू सो मच बालाजी so first of all uh, good morning good afternoon good evening and thank you to iit madras and ptl for um, having this session on uh, something which is the new frontier of technology uh, which is neuroscience inspired ai um, my name is nikhil malhotra and uh, i'm the chief innovation officer for tech mahindra and um, uh, good morning good afternoon good evening sorry. and thank you to iit madras and ptl um, you know one of um, um, one of my pivotal moments within tech mahindra has been setting up of our research and development wing which is called makers lab in tech mahindra and um, and post that we we do cutting edge research and development on ai on machine learning and some of the few topics that i'm going to discuss over here our um, my past experiences and my and 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 some of the experiences that go back about 10 15 years back um i was working with ibm as a software engineer and typically in um, and had the pleasure of working with watson where my first tryst with ai really started and i think i have um, i have looked at ai differently from that aspect and that facet itself but um, you know watson taught me the ideology of expert systems whereas the research that i did post watson uh, taught me something around what ai is and what ai could really take it forward or go forward with and one of the one of the junctures that i've reached now and it is important that the indian ecosystem also reach that specific point and juncture is what more and what beyond what we normally see in ai today and i've written a small statement to start off with and this statement really means that ai has to come out of its shadows of shallowness and absorb the world in its full expanse uh, we can no longer have older expert systems something that we saw with the with the deep blue beating gary kasparov in chess or ai systems that perform one task well most ai systems that you would see today would essentially be very very specific and perform one task at a what you know at one particular time whereas if you look at us and people who are listening to me at this point there'll be a large sector of parallel activities that you might be doing some of you would must be listening to this talk and at the same time you must be engrossed and engaged in a large series of work that you want to do on the side now in that context we need general ai systems and these systems need to draw an inspiration from the human brain which is according to me the most energy efficient and parallel computational device available to us at this point in time so we can draw an inspiration again there's a disclaimer that this is in no ways building up of sentient machines or drawing up something from a terminator a movie as you may remember and some and some of the talks that happen on the ai however it is it is quintessentially taking the component of intelligence from brain and seeing what can we do with the newer facets of algorithms or ai systems that we may have in the future now with that i would start and i would explain what our mission and vision is and my talk in this series since it's a very early talk and it talks about would talk about a broad range of algorithms or structures and also certain techniques that you may apply where you would become closer to agi or the artificial general intelligence and that has been primarily the mission on which i started the makers lab in tech mahindra we have a very set mission and vision i think our vision is very clear we want to connect with people and we want to simplify lives by creating experiences whereas the mission of us is for 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 us is basically building smart machines of the future and when we say smart machines of the future somewhere or the other this terminology of ai and machine learning is also utilized in a much more misnomeric terms these days every ppt every presentation has some sprucing of ai whereas the systems underneath or under the hood may be running into expert systems as well so we have categorically defined our mission into three formats making sure that we make ai machines creative and intelligent but when we do that we draw inspiration and in evolve those principles of machines from facets of neuroscience and let then these machines solve problems for customers for general research purposes or even for society so i think that's the premise on which i want to start today's talk and you will take through a series of discussions of these algorithms of what we do or techniques that are there present in the system bearing at a point where we say that these three are closest at this point in time and maybe some of the others that researchers are finding out um which can possibly solve ai or take ai to the agi level at this point now the reason why i wanted to start and most of you would know this <clears throat> is the and the reason why i did this was the epiphany that i had when i was discovering turing test 
and all of you in IITs and people joining in from other parts of the world would know that quintessentially Alan Turing, when he gave this test, essentially devised a kind of mechanism to, for us to test any AI or machine learning system. And the test is very, very simple. It essentially says that if you've got a human questionnaire sitting in the middle, separated by opaque walls, by a human respondent and a computer, whose task is basically to answer questions which the questioner asks. So it's basically a generic interview. The questioner keeps on asking questions to both the human and the computer. And by the end of this interview, if the questioner is not able to decipher a difference between the computer and the human, then the computer has seemingly won this battle and that test is called the Turing test or this test in which machines can out outlive or can outperform what we do as human beings of Turing test. I think uh, this, is, this is a very common test and most principles and structures are built around Turing test as well. If you look at from general purpose or AI in general, which is being utilized. However, people forget one thing that there may be a flaw and more characteristically, it may not be a flaw, but a condition where imitation is being considered as the order of the day. So if I can mimic intelligence, I am deemed intelligent, is the ideology on which Turing devised this test. And that mimicking of intelligence has somehow become the characteristic stone of what we do with AI and AI systems, which have become very, very limited in their scope and also in the activity that they perform. So if you, if you look at an AI system today, the AI system today appears to be constrained and specific. Please understand that in no ways, I'm essentially saying that AI systems are not good or they're not solving a problem. But at the point that you see that they are not generic, they are very, very specific in their act activity as well as applications. They would only do one task well. So if a machine is built in to understand images and classify those images, maybe cats and dogs, that's the only task that that model and algorithm can perform. If you wanted to perform a different kind of a task, let's say for language, you will have to put in a new model and train it again. Secondly, measures of temporality, hierarchy and memory are not inherently baked in into the machines as well as in the AI systems today. And these are quintessentially important for us to make ourselves as humans and evolve what we have done over a period of time as a species. We have temporality, which basically means time. So we make sequential decisions. And while we do decisions in our life, we actually reflect upon a large sector of our memory and the decisions that we had taken in the past, and they are all connected in some form or the other. We have hierarchy in the structure of the brain that I would explain during my talk. And we also have a memory component that is built in, and this is divided into, and scientists have discovered, neuroscientists have found out that there's a portion of, let's say, a long-term memory as well as a short-term memory that our brain has. And it's quintessentially the long-term memory that enables us to perform what we are doing at microseconds at different levels in a, in a, in a parallel way. Thirdly, AI will not be able to handle any shock and surprise at this point in time. You, uh, if it's trained on a certain bit of data, it's gotten the pattern structure of that data, it's understood that, it's taken a model and evaluated it. No other shock or surprise can actually, you know, if you give a different angle, if you give a different perspective, AI might be shocked and it might be surprised and it does not have the capability of adjusting and maneuvering itself because those algorithms don't have that ability at the moment. And that is something that is inherently present in every human being. From the portions of flight or fright or from what we have evolved into, we are capable of adjusting and turning ourselves, um, you know, in various ways and in various directions, depending on what is thrown at us. Now, most systems that you would see and you would encounter, they are either expert systems like Deep Blue or they're targeted pattern matches like Watson. And um, we have seen all of them gain a lot of success. Deep Blue was a great success um, when Deep Blue played Gary Kasparov and defeated him in chess. And Watson really won the Jeopardy challenge. And you could gasp at that machine and say, what's going on under the hood to make machine that intelligent that it can answer those questions. At the end of the day, they were either expert systems with a lot of rules being baked in and with the computational power, or they were pattern matching machines like Watson did. But if you look at some of the tasks that we perform very well, AI would really falter. I've given a picture over here of a, of a foggy day and almost instantly all of you would have, by looking at even the text on the left-hand side, you would have all gathered 
what's going on over here it's a train running on a foggy day on a track you would have guessed it because of the three lights normally represent an engine but you would have also said that you can see a faint structure of the railway line that is like actually coming across the uh, uh, across this image a large number of ai systems would falter over here if not trained properly because there's an optical flow illusion that's happening colors are not that succinct and colors are not changing in that specific regards now similarly this particular image that you see is easy now because of generative adversarial networks but about 2 years back it would be very difficult and even still difficult for ai to understand whether behind this obfuscation there is a face and also what gender that face may carry but for a human being it will be very very easy even a child in the 8th standard would be able to figure out these two images this is one of my favorite images and i've trained my machine on to it and for all of you it's a cat that is putting its head inside a box or a sandal um for the machines it looks like a polar bear for two specific reasons the machines don't have the capability of looking at the cat properly in this specific image because the machines cannot see the whiskers as well as the eyes and the ears of the cat um and on the other hand in some images that the machines were trained in or the ai system was trained in the back portion may represent a polar bear because it's more whitish in in color this is another one of an interesting image and you can take it and try it on the machines that have not been trained um a, a good number of my machines thought that this is a violin and it's not a cut chair even though a portion of the chair has been obfuscated now these shocks and surprises um it almost it's a kind of epiphany that 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 keeps happening to me saying that these are some things that human beings have a neural circuitry to perform whereas ai systems do not what's the reason behind it what's the biological constraint is it biologically constrained are we doing something with our algorithms so my research essentially took me to understand what's the biological facet behind how these brains operate and how do they really function and is there a model that we can really construct out of the brain before we go into what the algorithm may look like now i might want to take you to 1965 where hubel and wiesel did their first experiment what hubel and wiesel really did was they actually implanted an electrode into the cat's um, visual cortex and that was only one cell or one neuron of visual cortex and this is the visual area our visual cortex is also at the back of our brains and so is the cat's visual cortex and they actually placed an electrode over there and they, they this is a youtube video you guys can go and watch it or you can just type in hubel and wiesel and what they did to this experiment was they actually showed the cat these different you know different types of light not different formats this is a bar of light which is tilted at 45 degree angle when they rotated in front of this sector they would actually hear a crackling noise the crackling noise was only because hubel and wiesel converted the signal that came out from the cat's neuron into some kind of a noise and the neuron on which this particular you know which attachment was made made the maximum response and the maximum crackling when this ray or bar of light was actually kept at a 45 degree angle any other light format if you make it vertical if you give it in a large block um, you know that neuron would not respond the whole idea behind this and hubel and wiesel came out with the experiment was that there is every neuron or every little brain cell that is available into the human body as well as a mammalian structure has a specific receptive field the receptive field means that that neuron would respond back with maximum sensation when it is shown a certain bit of light structure color etc and that's only the visual part of it we have just not talked about the auditory structure as well so from hubel and wiesel's experiment what really came out was a definition of receptive fields and what it really said was what are receptive fields they are a specific property of a stimulus which actually generates a very strong response in a particular cell and mind you this is only one neuronal cell which means one neuron of which you would have seen the biological structure which looks like dendrites axons the myelin sheath the nodes of ranvier that actually conduct electricity in your brain this is only one neuron and every neuron has a specific kind of a receptive field it'll 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 crackle or let's say it'll um, you know it'll simulate a strong response based on what it is shown and why it is shown so these well, you know some examples were if you actually have a spot of light that is put on one particular location on the retina then that neuron responds back 
or let's say a bar of light in the hubel and wiesel experiment which was turned at a specific orientation and was at certain location on the retina that actually evolved this cell to give a response as well this was converted into receptive fields in the retina and this is basically what we do so what you see over here is the retina where you know any picture that we show at the back of the retinal structure you actually get an inverted image on the cornea of the of the retina and that image gets transferred to the back of our human brain as well which is the human you know visual cortex and and there are retinal ganglion cells which is one neuron so you would see that when that signal or when that particular cell would respond faster you would have a larger amplitude and frequency of these lines indicating amplitude remains the same but the frequency essentially matches and they are more huddled together which indicates that there's a strong stimulus coming in from one structure or one object or let's say a part of light and when they are you know they are sparsely distributed they would not have that kind of a strong stimulus response this ability of one particular cell to respond to let's say one form of light uh, when the light was switched on turned itself into center surround receptive fields and this was what hubel and wiesel said that uh, you know there are two formats of it one of them is called the on center of surround receptive field which basically means that the cell would respond robustly if the light is shined at the center of that cell or the light is not shined and is actually turned off on the outside of the cell in a similar way and the plus over here means that it's on and minus basically means it's off the off center and on surround receptive field says it's the reverse a cell may robustly respond if the light is turned off in the center of its position which is basically the neuronal structure or it will respond if the light opens up in the periphery sector and these two uh, receptive fields became very common for a large period of time before scientists discovered what's actually going on however while the while a single cell has an a center surround receptive field which you just saw that a cell may respond back based on whether whether the light comes in at particular center or on the surround what you are seeing with the cat or the cat experiment that hubel and wiesel did was that these fields really represent a kind of an oriented structure now the you know the cat neuron that they actually took the you, you, they took the reading from which was at the back of the visual cortex that actually essentially had a responded to a light which was at an angle of 45 degrees apart from that there are certain other cells which may respond back at us you know a line which is horizontal or lines which are placed like this how come the retinal ganglion cells or the cells that you see in your retina or your eye have a center surround mechanism but while this information when it reaches at the back of the brain in the visual cortex it suddenly becomes oriented so hubel and wiesel went into a kind of internal neuro circuitry and they found out that information from the retinal cell that is available over here actually goes in into a mechanism called the lgn which is part of the brain and called the lateral geniculate nucleus and from that there are large sector of wires that actually open up and they essentially come up with the primary visual cortex so basically there are large amount of lgn cells which are connected to one v1 cell in the beginning and even at the lgn the receptive field remains as you know this center surround whereas at v1 it becomes elongated now most of you if you see this you will find that this semblance is very similar to what you have seen in the neural network even though it does not cater to a large problem set of what neural network or what this system does what hubel and wiesel figured uh, didn't figure out was that it's not just these connections of lgn cells into v1 but there's a large amount of recurrence that is these cells are connected to each other themselves which are creating this but from this point of view can you not understand that if i really place these cells in a kind of a elongated structure and these center surround cells are placed in kind of a elongated view inside a structure at a slant they would essentially formulate this so actually what is happening is like neural network the weighted connections are being multiplied and the weighted connections are being added to activate a particular cell quite similar to what neural networks really evolved from but not like the same as to what the brain circuitry really does so you know this is what the biological understanding of the brain tells us that even though the neural circuits or the neural networks that were formulated had a semblance to what the circuitry could do but they were not really similar 
to what you know we were doing and these and they, there's something more that's happening inside the brain there's something more in which the brain's possibly looking at sequential decision making or it's trying to make decisions in sequences or in terms of sequence of time which is very very different that we do not understand in today's neural net the next part i want to talk about what is the algorithmic understanding about all of this right and this is uh, i'll take it in two formats i'll first talk about algorithms which are running and then i'll talk about the algorithms that we are working on from a synaptic perspective but what can really work on well and i think the only thing from an ai perspective or three or four things that you would see in the world and i would love india and indian you know universities to really go into that in a big way is to possibly get into the facet of reinforcement learning because that's the closest that we have seen that comes to an agi system where the systems are not given and so my next part of the talk is going to be about what are the principles of reinforcement learning before i come back to the brain and say how reinforcement learning and brain structures can be combined together but if you look at reinforcement learning this is the web what it does it at the center is the is the uh, components of reinforcement learning and then the other fields have actually taken or there is an inspiration in all the other fields as well in computer science you typically use it for machine learning for neuroscience you would have seen it as a reward system like for example you give rewards to a kid when he does well or it doesn't and if he doesn't do well you possibly take it away in a similar way that you deal with your pets in psychology you essentially apply it as an operant conditioning in economics it's bounded rationality and in mathematics it's all about operations research but at the core sector of it the art and the science of what we do as human beings is the ideology of sequential decision making can we make decisions which are dependent upon the last effort also without any supervision and can we essentially bring out that facet and this is where the reinforcement learning fac facets come into being now what are the characteristics and examples of this number 1 things that make reinforcement learning different from all the other paradigms are there's no supervisor in in fact most of the uh, machine learning algorithms that you have done they are either supervised in this world or there is an unsupervisory element which is basically clustering but in reinforcement learning you will have no supervisor but only a reward signal to guide you and when you say a reward signal it's basically dependent upon what is the structure of the brain which is the dopamine and serotonin where your human brain would try to do something because there's an there's there's an appeal and and there's this happiness that you get or there'll be or, or it will it it will not do that work feedback is almost always delayed and it's sometimes and it's sometimes instantaneous but it's almost always delayed which basically means that this agent or this supervisory or or this reinforcement learning agent will possibly look at feedback at a at a longer scale or maybe later down the line so it's about thinking about the future a there's no supervisory b the feedback is delayed and c time really matters so all the components of the brain which basically looks at temporalness which looks at you know the memory component are basically put put up into the reinforcement learning and it's a concept which is built on dopamine and the serotonin structures as well now some of the examples that you would see this working and you would have seen it in your lifetime as well um alpha go defeating lee sedol in the go championship which was basically learned by the machine itself after having played about 500 to 1000 games or maybe more than that or fly stunt maneuvers in a helicopter which is normally not possible by a human being but a helicopter learns to do this or a toy helicopter learns to do this over there managing an investment portfolio for example where the machine has to get the reward is that you get uh, you know when you when you make a good deal and the and the uh, negative reward is when you actually lose a deal and the machine manages its own investment portfolio or call center operations controlling a power station when to switch off when to switch on um, dependent upon what's the current energy surge and last but not the least autonomous driving vehicles you want to have an autonomous driving vehicle in a country like india where rules are not very well set where rules are completely off the guard but you want a machine to learn from a driver who drives carefully and then take on that value on its own those are certain characteristics and examples now what is a reward a reward rt represented by reward at time t is a scalar feedback signal and i call it scalar because a reward has to be a measurable entity some of you might have this information or might think about it that why can't a reward be vector it can be but in reinforcement learning paradigm and formalism it's always kept as a scalar value 
And for the reason for that is that the AI agent has to do an action and that action has to depend upon a certain sequence of events to attack on the next one so that we get the maximum cumulative reward at the end of the day. And in order to compare something, you have to put them onto one scalar line or axis and then compare them together. So that's why a reward RT is a scalar feedback signal. It also indicates how well an agent is doing at step T so that what should my next strategy be as a reinforcement learning agent or what should I do um, in terms of solving a specific problem that I have been given. The job of the agent is to maximize the cumulative record. And that is that I may suffer in a way that I may leave the reward at one time. I do not care what, what, what is my current instantaneous structure, but my whole app, you know, my whole possibility is that my reward at the end of the day should actually be cumulative and I should win at the end. That's how the structure of this is made, very similar to how human brains operate and how humans operate. So reinforcement learning in general is based on reward hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that all goals can be described by the maximization of an expected cumulative record. So, so you the, the any goal that you have within the system or ecosystem can actually be a, a maximization of these expected cumulative reward as well. So that's the art of sequential decision making, where the goal is that the agent needs to select an action to maximize total future reward. And this agent could be anything in a large sector frame. It could be a robot which is trying to walk in an environment and trying to peruse the environment. Um, let's say we put a robot in Pune and that robot has not been picked up or a car. The ideology is by looking at things, by looking at the environment, the robot has to make its own decision so that the maximum future reward so that I do not create more accidents is the, is the value that I do. Rewards may be delayed. Um, because the action may have long-term consequences. So for example, if you're playing a game of chess or if you're playing a game of backgammon or Go, you may leave a reward at, at an instantaneous value and you may pick up something which is which has got a far-reaching effect so that I can defeat the opponent as well. And, and in that similar scenario, it's easier to sacrifice a reward sometimes. Um, now let's take a case of a helicopter and I may want to fuel. I may not do this trick or you know that's the that's the act of the ai agent that that i can avoid doing a trick but i can save a little bit of fuel and once i have fueled enough i can then train myself again to do that trick before you know which was which was there so so the ideology typically a step towards and these are some ramblings and re re remnants of what can you see when you are essentially looking at towards an agi system and when you're looking from a perspective of what a machine may get into, right? And, and from a future perspective of neuroscience. So the general way in which this algorithm works is that you've got an agent which we build, which is basically the reinforcement learning agent. The agent does an action on the environment. The environment is the world in which you sit in. This could be a problem or this could be a world in which the robot has to move. This could be an investment portfolio. This could be the fly stunts that the helicopter needs to do. The environment pushes out, based on the action of the agent, the environment pushes out two recordings. One's an observation and one's a reward um, at that time t. Now the agent looks at this observation, looks at that reward, and in order to maximize the cumulative future reward, does the next best action for the environment. And that environment responds back automatically. So this is how the general algorithm works. So at each step t, you will see that the agent will execute an action at. It's basically the same thing that is uh, written over here receives an observation, receives a scalar reward, the environment receives an action from the agent and the environment emits an observation, emits another reward. And this cycle continues unless the agent has trained itself to understand the environment in which it was put in, if it's partially observable or if it's fully observable, then the agent can actually work in tandem with the environment. Now that's the basic premise. Now, if you look at this structure of, of this particular algorithm, it is very similar to how Neuroscience has told us that human brains work. We typically work, we, we typically take the next step and we look at and gauge at the environment, even though you cannot comprehend it consciously, but subconsciously your brain's ticking at microseconds to essentially do that. It looks at the environment, gauges the information, does an action to the environment, which is a sensory motor neuron response from your body, which is reaching out your hand to something or basically pulling out certain other things and then taking the next observation in and doing the next action. It happens pretty fast with the human body, but for an algorithm to be built into that level, this is what a general algorithm looks like. Now, if you look at a stream of or history of such records, like for example, 
um, there was an action done by um, you know by the agent there was an observation by the environment there was a reward that we see it actually follows a stream of history so basically you have a stream of history which says um, at time t ht would be you know a combination of o1 a1 r or, or whatever a linear combination of all of these points this history is not useful uh, you know it, it, there's a lot of lot of information of stream so what we really do is that a state however is a better representation of that particular history so a state really represents or defines a function as to in a way that basically tells what's the important component of the history that you need to pick out and what you need to present to the agent so that agent can perform the next best action so in very generic terms a state can be defined as a function of history which is basically what we deal with states rather than histories as well now there are different types of states as well one of them is an environment state the state where there is an internal representation of the environment so these are numbers these are vectors um, you know these are information which an environment holds on itself dearly data that that the environment has so, so for, suppose for example you are actually dealing with an investment portfolio or let's say let's make it simple you are actually dealing it with a game as well because reinforcement learning started off with a lot of games you're dealing with a little bit of a game and the game has a console like an xbox what goes inside that console of xbox is hidden to you you can only see the screen or what the game produces in front of you on the tv whereas whatever is the environment's internal state which is the xbox internal value what numbers what registers it is actually operating is unknown to you so the environment state is practically not known and it's virtually invisible to the agent we do not really see the environment barring in some cases um, where environment is visible to, to to the system the agent state however is the algorithm state that we are building which is the internal representation of the agent which we are trying to do and that is something that is incumbent on us how do we make it and that could be a representation or a function of any format of history it can take the entire history it can take a some kind of a linear combination of history but that is the state which we have to build in for an agent which is the algorithm that you are building or the model that you are building where it actually uh, takes in the data that i am receiving and builds a use case or a structure so that it can take the next best action now this can be referred to as sta with the superscript of a which means the state of the agent and it's useful and it's completely visible to us because we are making this algorithm as a function of history there's one more state however and that is called the information state the information state is also sometimes referred to as the markov state i've marked it as red and that contains the useful information about the history now a particular state is called a markov when the probability of the state that comes next dependent on the previous state is equivalent to all the events or states that you have seen in the past which essentially means that you can get rid of the past and you can only look at the immediate past to define the future so what it really means is that the future is independent of the previous states and if you know uh, future is independent of the past given the present state which really means is that if i have one state before my current state i am good enough to tell you the future i do not need the previous states and that's a formalism which is basically called markov state in a tautological sense you can actually take the entire state structures you can take the entire history of what has happened in the past but markov state means and markov conditioning means that if you can remove everything from the states and the history and only look at the probability of the one previous state then you're good enough to predict what my future is and you can you can consider it and imagine it for example in a helicopter experiment where uh, you know the helicopter's wind shear the yaw the pitch uh, the the fuel structure at which the helicopter stands at this point uh, its next move will only be dependent on this present state <laughs> it is not dependent upon what happened in the past how did the helicopter reach at this point and that's a markov condition or a markov state as well now there are as i mentioned fully observable environments where the environment is completely observable an agent is a part of this and this uh, you know becomes a, a condition where the where the ot which is basically the observation um, is equivalent to the state of the agent and the state of the environment and this process is typically called as markov decision process or mdp um as we commonly call it it's a markov state but at the same time it's a decision process which is markov however in practical life you would never get a state which is fully observable or an environment which is fully observable in that scenario the formalism that is used is pomdp or partially observable uh, environment or an mdp 
when this condition happens, when the environment is not known, which is mostly the practical scenarios, I would not know the environment in which my agent operates. I would not know uh, the game's internal environment. I would never know what's going on within the within the you know the algorithms of what happens in an investment company. But I have to make an algorithm to get my investment portfolio. In that scenario, we can we have to make that agent state, and that agent state can actually be used by different methods. For example, you can use a naive method, which is basically remove all the Markov state properties and say my state of the current agent depends on the entire history. It's a naive method, but it is possible. You can set up a probabilistic belief where you can say that the probability of one particular state uh, at a specific time is S1 and that is the state of the agent because it happens to be, and this is a probability distribution graph that you can build in. Or you can build a recurrent mechanism where you say that one previous state um, you know, with a weighted response of what happened in that state with an observation, current observation and a weight and do a kind of linear combination and a non-linear response to it can actually become the state of this. There are different mechanisms that you can do. You can either you use either of those mechanisms to build your state. And this is left open to the, uh, to the developer who actually does this. What are the major components of an RL agent? And this is important for you to understand because that will allow you to make the RL agents uh, um, uh, better. The first things that we do in an RL agent is the policy. And the policy is something that defines the agent's behavior or what should an agent do to actually receive a you receive maximum award or to reach to a particular state as well and this policy is either deterministic so what we can do is we can take it as a function of the state so whatever happened in this state what should be the next action and i'll explain you with an example this is a deterministic policy or you can make a completely stochastic policy where you can say the probability of or or the policy at this point is the probability of an action dependent upon or conditioned upon a state that did. And <clears throat> these are different ways in which policies could be set up. And you have different measures in which you can set up a policy. So the policy defines what should the next action of an agent be if I'm seeing a particular state. A value function, which is a second component of RL agent is, which defines how good or bad is it when you are in a particular state or action. So um, it's basically an expectancy of a reward. And what it says is, hey, I took an action, I reached a certain point. Let's define my value function at this point. What is, is it good? Is it bad? And it can simply be ex uh, applied as an expectancy of rewards. Rewards at time t plus one, t plus two, t plus three, dependent upon what happened in a state. But also um, these rewards are discounted by a factor called gamma, because as you move ahead in time, the possibility of getting those rewards in a current state reduces. So the idea is that I have a value function. So the moment I take a action on a specific state inside the agent, I actually look at what's the value function for the next group of states which are available. The model is agent's representation of the environment. Please understand this is not the environment itself. It is how what I think is going to be the representation of that environment as an agent or as an algorithm. And they could be based on, again, probability metrics of, uh, of transition-based model where you say that the state at t plus one would be at certain point or should, should be certain state s dash or s prime, dependent upon what's the state and what's the action taken. Or there could be an expectancy reward model as well, which basically says, or, or a model saying, this is the reward if, let's say, for example, the state was s and the action was a. So these three are the quintessential components of an RL agent. So when we build an RL agent, which is, which is, uh, which is easier said than done, the idea is to define a policy. The idea is to define a value function of each state where you're going to solve a problem. And the idea is to define a model. Now, please understand that in some cases, this environment and this model and this policy is learned on its own, which gives it the right to come closer to what we call as AGI. Now, this is an example of a maze. The maze example is you start from here and you end at the goal. And you can have two, way, two ways of looking at it. The reward is that you have minus one because you have to reach at the at the you know smallest possible time to this particular goal. Actions are north, east, south, or west because you can take your arrows over there. And the state is at the current location of the agent. Now you can have two ways: a policy layout, a policy layout which says that when you are at particular state, <clears throat> you can actually only go right. So, for example, if you're sitting at this point, you can only go right. At this point, you can only go up because you have to reach that specific point. If you go down, that you may not reach this goal. At this point, your, your policy conditions say that you can do. You can either take a policy layout 
or you can take a value function layer. So this square is minus 16 steps away from this particular goal. So your value function looking at this square is minus 16. And if you've made an agent that will actually take the shortest possible route to that goal, you, you, you know the answer. You know that the next step is going to be something which is smaller than or, or maybe larger as a policy. So you actually go to minus 15. The next step is going to be minus 14. So you can either build your state of, um, of the agent in a value function layout or you can do it as a policy layout. Uh, either of them works or both of them work in certain cases. So that is what defines an RL agent. It is either value-based where you have only value and no policies. So you can only have a value function of your problem and you can have no policies and the agent would learn the policy implicitly. You can make it policy-based where you have a policy, but you have no you have no model, you have no value uh, attached to it and the agent would learn out all the others. Or you have an actor critic where there's both policy and value functions are given and the agent involves. And similarly, you can have a model-free environment where there's no model, you don't know the environment, you don't know what's going on, but you have a policy and a value function and you drop the agent inside the, inside the environment and the agent figures it out on its own. Or you can also have a model-based structure where you know the environment and the agent can possibly look at the policy or the value function. There are some fundamental problems which the RL is trying to solve. And one of them is the reinforcement learning problem and where it becomes closer to what an AGI system would do, where the problem is that the environment is unknown. An agent is just dropped into the environment and it knows itself and it updates itself. You would have seen it with Atari games that Go did or, uh, or um, uh, you know, AlphaGo did uh, with DeepMind. You would also seen it in AlphaGo, which is, uh, which is done. There's also a planning problem where environment is known, but I now need my agent to hone its policy based on the environment itself. How should the agent really plan the environment, which is more of a, uh, um, of a machine learning or an AI task that is there. But there's a third policy, which is important which also makes it very, very similar to what we do from a human brain perspective, which is exploration and exploitation. So, and let's consider a scenario that I like to eat at a particular restaurant because it serves a certain food. So I almost all, always go out to that restaurant to eat, but one day I decide to explore a new land and I find out that there's a new restaurant which may be even better than the previous one that I was going. So this exploration and exploitation policy by definition is baked in into an RL agent, where we essentially try and explore and exploit at the same time and maintain a balance and, um, you know, and get the best cases. And that's why sometimes these agents outperform the human ingenuity principle, because they are in a larger mode of exploration as well, along with, of course, exploiting what they really know. The other facet of where we go in from the RL perspective or a reinforcement learning perspective is also the evolutionary mechanism. Uh, human beings have evolved and the evolutionary mechanism is basically the genetic algorithm which we're doing. It's an adaptive heuristic search mechanism. It's got no gradient descents. It's got genetic operator. So it's basically working like a genetic system or a genetic pool. Uh, the, the way life progresses, the way species evolve, it's basically an algorithm that evolves based on this. Sometimes these genetic algorithms are also put inside the RL to know a certain structure. Now, what's the advantage? If you guys are looking towards machine learning and AI today, you would have almost always gotten into a problem where your model has trained to a certain value and it does not give you any accuracy or any precision beyond a certain point. And the reason simply for that is that the model has attained a local optimum. Now, local optimum is basically hills and valleys where there's one valley, which is supposedly the global optimum, Whereas the agent or whatever model you trained reached at some other valley besides it and decided that this is going to be the end. And I would not change my value based on whatever you might do. And this is the accurate value over there. It may not be the actual accuracy that you reach. If in these scenarios, you have to learn to do a search, there is none better than a genetic algorithm that you may apply. The genetic algorithm basically has no gradient descent and actually takes care of the local optima because it nullifies that facet to reach to the right possible way. Um, if, you, if you consider a problem in the machine learning and AI world some 10, 15 years back, one of the biggest problems was the traveling salesman problem. And the traveling salesperson problem was I have traveled all, I, I start from a point in India, I touch every city and I come back to my city with the shortest possible route. There are infinite solutions. Um, it's only possible through a supercomputer or a quantum computer, as we call it, 
but genetic algorithms can actually give near optimal results to that tsp problems as well so that's the reason and there's a there's a there's a kind of an uh, there's a kind of a, a flow chart for this basically what you do is you start from um, from the point and you create a population of possible solution spaces you see whether the population are right or not if they are not right then you essentially go and you create a mating pool of individuals these individuals come from the environment you do a crossover you do a mutation uh, you replace the original population and this process keeps on going unless a specific convergence is found this simple genetic flow chart is found to be more effective than most of the machine learning techniques that you would have possibly seen the reason why i've put it over here is because in most of the reinforcement learning cases or some of them we basically apply this evolutionary techniques to genetic algorithms to essentially do that one practical example that we have applied genetic algorithms is basically finding out the structure of a molecule that binds well with the covid virus protein as well and 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 there was a genetic algorithm that was applied for about 1000 searches to find out what molecular structure would actually fit in well um over there and this is an example of uh, and reinforcement learning typically based does that. i told you that i'll come back to the brain while <clears throat> most there, there is a, there are, there are loads of problems still available with reinforcement learning the reason why i went and talked about this is that the approach towards neuroscientific modeling and neuroscientific structures will appear only through rl or through understanding the brain the the large number of people who may be listening at youtube etc may take this as a research area where there are certain problems which are available within the reinforcement learning that you would tend to solve and these are multimodal modes how can you make rl more compliant to you know a large parallel structure or stream that may be appearing those are some of the problems that you may want to look at um and, and that that is basically giving you just an intent of what we do since this is only a class for one lecture um in the subsequent lectures we can go into much deeper onto problems of the reinforcement learning however i did not want to leave on one facet which is with reinforcement learning there'll be a prop there'll be a condition that will be left for synapses as well and which is how the human brain works and i come back to the point that the cortex has only got one algorithm and there has been enough researches and research is done where a portion of the cortex which was actually connected and this is done with hamsters because they're closest somehow or the other in the in the brain format of the macaque monkey as well where um, where a portion of the brain which was connected with the hand um, and allowing them a sensory motor touch system which was called a somatic sensory cortex was actually broken off that nerve was broken off and that was connected to the retina um, of that of that monkey within 3 months scientists found that that portion of the brain that was initially meant to feel touch started seeing in the real meaning of the word see that means it started functioning as a seeing system um, a similar result was done for the auditory cortex and they found a similar result as well um, the reason why they took the hand example as well as the auditory cortex is because the auditory cortex takes a logarithmic response of information whereas uh, a hand would take a linear response of information so in order to combine these two they have actually looked at these things it happened so that the brain may only have one algorithm and it adjusts itself in parallel modes in the way it receives data from a different kinds right and and then they went into the physiology of the brain on your left you see the reptilian brain which has got its own pallium hippocampus for spatial memory uh, and, and that is possibly the portion of memory that scientists say is the only portion of memory that is available that will essentially give us um, you know that that can essentially solve the problem for an ai system as well and on the right you have the human brain this human brain is about 75% similar to what a reptilian brain is and it should be because we consider reptiles as our long or 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 a four long uh, ancestors from which we have evolved barring one portion of the human brain which we at makers lab try and provision along with some of the techniques of reinforcement learning which is the neocortical portion this is the new brain and that's why it's called neocortex holds about 75% of volume by brain structure if you crumple it together it's like a crinkled sheet of paper and would actually be fitting in into your palm like a hanky or a handkerchief but contains the entire structure of intelligence that you today have in your human life your beliefs faiths disbeliefs memories um uh, the the way you format your structure the way you behave all is dependent upon this 75% structure or 75% by volume structure which is available in your human brain 
which is roughly about three fourths of what the entire uh, one fourth of what the entire brain is composed of. Now, if you go deeper, and we can we can give this uh, uh, you know this cre credibility to Mr. Uh, Dr. Crick. Um, uh, Dr. Crick was also responsible for the double helix structure of the DNA, but he also wanted to discover what human brains are, and he actually opened up a hamster brain and incidentally dropped a dye. Um, and this was a black dye that he dropped into the brain. And somehow or the other, when he took a cross section of that of that human brain, he, uh, of that hamster brain, he found out that the internal structure of the brain looks like this. It's remarkable it, the way neurons are connected. There are so many structures, and this is a hamster brain. This is not even a human brain. Um, the the way they are connected, it's like a hierarchy of structure. So he said it's a hierarchy of regions. Regions are remarkably similar across spaces and modalities. Um, all regions seem to perform a similar function. We have found this result in the grid cells or the cortical columns inside the human structure today, where the end unit or processing unit of every human brain is the cortical column containing grid cells, which is the quintessential, which quintessentially performs exactly the same algorithm all across. And uh, deduction is that all regions recognize sensory sequences, all of them recognize sensory motor sequences, and they generate motor responses as a result. So uh, it's one algorithm. Uh, whereas in, 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 in statistical formats or in AI format, there are different algorithms to solve different problems. And that's the quintessential research problem or the problem that AI is going to go through in the next four or five years. Because there are a lot of research scientists and companies working on this, where they would take you through this format, whereas where a semblance of AGI, um, uh, where a system may have the ability to respond to parallel activities may come in because it's exactly the same structure everywhere. Now, uh, I've already explained it. The cortical theory sees, it says it's a 2.5 mm layer. It's a sheet of cell anatomically and functionally. It's a hierarchical structure that is built in. Uh, there are cellular layers which are clearly marked with, by neuroscientists. There are layers from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2, and 3 perform similar functions. Neurons are with synapses. There are 10% which are proximal and about 90% distal neurons. And these regions are remarkably similar. So the brain typically performs a similar function. How does it perform? Parallel functions is still a mystery. How can you lift up your ears, uh, lift up your hands, and even listen to some of the other voices that are coming into your, into your mind is, is a mystery, which people are trying to solve along with us. Or <clears throat> we are also looking towards it from an AI angle. Now, each layer in the brain also implements a kind of um, variation of sequence. Um, you, have, you have layers one, two, three, four, and uh, you know sensory data typically comes in in layer four. Um, it goes up into level three or level two and three. If this layer is not able to understand that sequence, is not able to infer, uh, that, that means there's a slight bit of a challenge and it actually passes it on to the next higher region. Um, you would have experienced this uh, in practical lives when you go to your home uh, and you suddenly see your doorknob shifted from right to left. Um, that's a sequence response at the level two or three, which you fathomed later. Some of you might be able to understand right over there uh, because you saw a change in that doorknob from right to left position, some of you would open the door and instantly after closing the door, the brain would kick back and say, there was a miss. Uh, there was something which was very different. The knob had shifted to the left. That happens because the sequence command of the sensory neurons, which is the sequential data that is coming in, comes in the level two and three. And if there's a jumbling of efforts over here where something that you expect it to happen, uh, did not happen, then it goes on to the higher region and you suddenly have a blip. And that blip is something that actually binds out the brain and says, hang on, there was a change over there. This characteristic sequence that you are seeing in with your structure and you're seeing with your brain is so remarkable and so fantastic that you can draw almost the entire universal format with this structure of sequence. And that's exactly what a human brain does. It predicts the next step. When you walk, your brain's predicting what the floor should be just after you keep the next step. And that's why it allows you to keep that next step. When you, um, you know, uh, when, when, you, when, you, when you're thinking something, it's already predicting about the future. This is exactly what happens inside the brain for you to do that. And it applies to all <clears throat> modalities. Now, if you learn a sequence on the right-hand side, like one, two, three, four, you and four, five, three, two, these sequences have the same structure over here. So if I say one, two, three, and it's a four letter word, you were expecting four to happen. Your sensory responses came into the sequence memory. You knew that I was four. 
so it would also be four if you do not see four this particular signal because you saw something very different goes to the higher region where it gets processed into a much more abstract format where there are other layers as well on top of the brain which are doing it and again with the same with the 4532 as well <laughs> how does the brain do this is because it keeps a sparse distributed representation um, a dense representation a representation is something that we do in silicon where we have few bits we combine all of those bits whereas it has been found out that at any point in time at any signal your brain is working roughly between 40 to 50% of sparse density so neurons are not firing all of a sudden again for the aided ones and people who know neural networks and thinking they would have instantly guessed that there is a change that may happen because in neural networks the activation of the second third and the fourth layer happens almost instantaneously and all neurons get activated there's no attention given to one particular neuron or not all the perceptrons are fired whereas your brain does not do that the brain fires in a sparse value and it fires at a at a level of about 40% 50% value and that sparsity allows the brain to actually get a semantic meaning and learning out of it which then passes on to the higher regions we have actually <clears throat> inside the makers lab we have done an experiment and this is a this is a technique which is called hierarchical temporal memory modeling which was also being projected in us by some of the uh, some of the companies like numenta and we did a kind of an experiment of our own and we actually told them this was an experiment where we applied a similar technique with a silicon neuron where we actually built it in a simulation format and we found that it with lesser amount of data and with only the sparse semantic construct it was actually performing much better than a neural network with large amounts of data i've given into it now what are the ideological shifts i don't want to talk about the neuroscientific facet over here and i i don't want to go through brain how brain shifts memories but you can do this thought experiment and if i was to ask each one of you to fill this next three letters you would get infinite number of responses and those responses if you just recollect those responses and look at your life about an hour a day back those responses are a result of what you have touched and felt and seen in the very recent past with this app somebody who was have just eaten an apple would have spelt it as apple because that's something which is in short term memory in the structure and it's actually giving its information up to the to the system or to the neuron to actually fire off or somebody would have dealt with an application as a software programmer his next response would have been an application some of them would be appropriate in certain ways or that could be a word but each one of you may have a different connotation of these three uh, you know blanks dependent upon what your life currently has seen in the recent past and that also comes to the point where there's a whatsapp message that keeps on rotating uh, which is a fun activity you say you are the genius in the world if you can spell these words almost all of us can um, barring there's a problem with a or a genetic problem with a neuronal structure all of you should be able to spell these words because it does not matter in what sequence they appear your brain has already started predicting the value before it reaches the end and when it sees the end and when it sees the syllable and the phenom over there it automatically predicts what it may have happened and that's the beauty of this brain structure which is parallel and which is advancing um, you know every every microsecond for me it's about serving our customers in tech mahindra but also a scientific pursuit where neuroscience inspired ai or you know techniques like reinforcement learning in the future can lead to these many values which can be exoplanet discovery um nuclear fusion talking about science and chemical synthesis about how we can treat cancer how we can look at um how we can look at some of the microbial infections that have just come in um art and design um you know this engine that you see on the right hand side is actually designed by an ai and it's possibly the per perfect coolant mechanism that you can put in inside the car as an engine and uh, the other applications could be virtual assistants even though we say there are loads of virtual assistants in india with 1645 dialects and 26 mother tongues i don't think any one of them works so there's a huge capability and possibility available um with these reinforcement learning agents to learn or to neuroscience inspired ai to learn and get that synaptic value into these languages as well so with that i want to thank each one of you um i would look at some of the questions that you have given in but um, uh, this talk was generally essentially to say that ai of today is no longer uh, relegated to pattern matching 
the next greater step in the next five years would definitely be AI, which is inspired by the human brain. And also looking at facets of reinforcement learning, geometric deep learning, and also some of the other things that are going on with the brain science. So since this is IIT, this is one of the premier institutes and also a lot of intelligent people on the call. This is also a kind of a clarion call to say that Indian research should also now go towards neuroscience inspired AI as well. So thank you. Balaji, do we, uh, sorry. Yeah, so should we take in the questions that have come in from uh, Google Docs and I can then. Okay, I'll simply I'll simply start with some of the questions that has come in, and um, I'll just name the person. Shivani basically says that she's a psychology graduate, uh, and um, and and she's a Sanskrit postgraduate as well. Um, I wish to ask you how Sanskrit can really be used for betterment of AI uh, with a non-technical background. I, I think that's a fantastic question to start off with, Shivani. I can possibly give you a kind complete lecture because this is one of our research areas. But uh, but the reason why Sanskrit's important in today's world and we are looking at it as a as a more of a translation layer between different languages is for primarily one reason um, the language in itself has an inflection value attached now when panini made sanskrit there were two questions that he wanted to answer number one was uh, how is human thought encoded into language that i speak so you are listening to me and i'm speaking that language and how does your brain perceive that language and then make a meaning out of it or decode it where is that information hiding in a language structure was Panini's genius. Um, and if I can use a simple word over here that I am going to my village, ahem gramam gachami is something that I would write in Sanskrit. Uh, I am going to my village would be an English connotation and Hindi could be main gaon jata hu or, you know, in different languages. The problem over here is, or Panini's genius is, problem I'll come to later, but Panini's genius over here was, to understand that the only thing that encodes the meaning of this particular sentence is the last letter me. It's not the noun ahem. It's not the pronoun gramam. It's basically the last word me, which is basically the visarg or the bhasha of it, which basically encodes the meaning. If I only say gramam gachami, that, me, that meaning does not change. Whereas in English, it will be village go, which has no connotation and meaning. If I say gachami gramam, that exactly means the same thing because the language is encoded inside me and not in some, some other format. So that is the genius of how Sanskrit really does an inflection point and is therefore easier to understand as well as to relate to some of the other languages. That's number one. Number two is that <clears throat> Sanskrit connotationally, when you start, you start with the why of a problem. And if you look at Ashtadhyayi that Panani formulated, it started off with uh, Maheshwar Sutras. And that Maheshwar Sutras, basically, I would run, run, uh, you know, some of these things that actually came in. Panini starts with that simple ask. And the ask is, when I speak something, what two syllables or what two swar and vyanjan should I take? Why should I take it? And that's quintessentially the reason and the logic behind the language growing into that format. So, uh, so with your non-technical background, even if, if you have got a strong structure of Sanskrit, that's where AI or betterment of AI would go. In fact, we have just released a concept called Bhamal, which is Bharat Markup language, which enables students to actually code in their own languages, their HTML, which is Gujarati, Punjabi, etc. We are also trying to put a layer of Sanskrit on top so that we can understand it. Uh, 
I, I think somebody asked, sir, please share. Alisha asked, please share about a study at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology. I think RMIT, I did my master's um, and I did a small little research dissertation as well over there. Um, RMIT, RMIT in, uh, in Melbourne was instrumental in giving me that research push as well. Um, the idea of, you know, they, uh, the way they essentially looked at not just the test scenarios, but also the practical exam. I had loads of things and I did my master's in distributed computing. Uh, because at that time, these were more about distributed databases and distributed structures, etc., which really changed to AI later down the line. So. <laughs> so, yeah, I won't answer this question. Priyanka has asked, when we see dreams, does it ever come true? I don't know. <laughs> I think I can give you a scientific explanation, but not tell you whether your dreams would come true. I think your dreams would come true if uh, you really work towards those dreams. Um, so, um, I, I think Shipra says, kindly describe what is actual actually AI. So if I really have to describe Shipra, what is AI is, it's basically transferring your knowledge to a machine. It could be anything which is of the human intelligence, something that you have not done from a human perspective and you have relegated that effort to a machine to do this. Now, the term AI is called artificial intelligence because it's not natural. The term was coined in 1956 in Dartmouth College when Marvin Minsky and some of the other greats at that time were trying to describe what an AI should look like and what should a machine really do because it has to augment a human life. Please remember that the onset of AI was also the onset of industrialization. <clears throat> so we wanted machines which are mechanized. We wanted machines that can do our work more. We wanted machines that are more energy compliant and you know com more complacent to us and also machines that can help us do work faster. That's why we went from bullock cars from an energy source to a to a car, to a plane, to a steamer boat, etc. And that's all progression in terms of mechanics of machines. From a software perspective, in order to make these machines move, we also needed to have an ecosystem to actually make them more intelligent so that they do just don't become a kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a kind of a only uh, order taking system. They should have a little bit of intelligence to preempt a certain kind of disaster for human beings because of their processing power. And that's generally what is referred to as here. Is it possible to map creativity using AI? There's uh, somebody from Kolkata, Iona. Yes, absolutely. And that is one of those research areas where creativity is being positioned. I'll tell you an example. And I would request each one of you to see this movie uh, on, uh, on AlphaGo. It's actually called a documentary movie on AlphaGo. If you guys can watch it, it'll be fantastic. Um, in the third game itself, the machine does a move. And, and, and please remember, most of you from India would know chess. The game of Go is not really known because it's more of a Chinese sector game and it's played in South Korea and parts of Southeast Asia. But Go is significantly very, very difficult to handle. Uh, a chess may have 64 squares. A Go has about 19 by 19 squares. The number of combinations of Go is basically 10 raised to power 170. Somebody has said that the number of combinations that you can apply in Go is equivalent to the number of atoms in the universe. So it makes the game very, very hard. And it has been a long-standing problem for humanity to basically look at how AI can solve Go as a problem. Um, because this game seems to be most ingenious, most creative. And if you see that documentary, you will also feel the need of the people saying, why do they play Go? Because it gives rise to their creativity and their ingenuity. And it actually makes them meet their own soul. The whole idea of Go is it's played with white and black stones. You have to cover as much territory on the ground as possible and make the other person defeat, um, uh, defeated or whatever. Now, in game three, AlphaGo, which is a computer AI system, does a move that has not been done in decades in the history of Go by a human being. And typically, humans don't use that line. It was a move on the uh, on the row 37. On uh, you know, on it was 37th move on the fifth row, which is not done by by machine. By giving that move, AI became creative because a reinforcement learning agent was telling the AI that you can sacrifice a line, whereas you can win it later down the line. That is creativity in AI. And that move has taught a lot of Go players across the world on how to better play Go. So creativity of a human being was enhanced because of an AI system. So that's your example of why AI... Uh, is used. So somebody said, can we get um, the PPT used? Um, I can send it to um, uh, IIT Madras and you can definitely use it, right? So 
So I think there are loads of questions and we are out of time. Uh, I can either answer these questions separately and they can go to your mail. Um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, Balaji, you are there. Maybe you can, you, you can chat. Sorry, I wanted uh, people from IIT Madras to chime in if there is, uh, uh, if, if I can send these questions on an email because there are loads of questions coming in from people. If I can write it separately to these uh, these people because they have their email IDs, yeah. Okay, no response. Okay, since it's since it's wave of the hour, I will I will take your leave and I will I will um, 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 it's a pleasure and I know there are lots of questions that are coming in on to the uh, on to the Google Forms. Please sending in your please keep sending your questions. I would try and answer over the next two days and I'll try and answer that individual person about that question and I will respond back. I'm also available on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn and if you want to ask a question over there, more than happy to answer on a private chat. Um, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you to IIT Madras and thank you to NPTL and uh, and uh, thank you all. The only thing is the flame of AI and the flame of neuroscience inspired AI needs to be live. Uh, please take care and stay safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I will close the live, sir. Thank you. Thank you.